Welcome to another edition of Unfettered Freedom, your weekly GNU slash Linux news video podcast. Packing so much freedom into each episode, it ought to be illegal. There's so much freedom packed into this podcast that simply by listening to this podcast, your neck beard will grow long and your social interactions will become difficult. On this episode of Unfettered Freedom, Eric Raymond has made a bold prediction regarding Windows 10 and Linux. He thinks that Linux will ultimately win the battle against Windows. Also, the Respondus Lockdown Browser. This was something I was not aware of, but apparently Respondus is another one of these pieces of spyware that schools and universities are forcing their students to install on their own machines. DRM, we're going to discuss DRM, which is Digital Rights Management, although that name is not very accurate because DRM is designed to limit your rights, your freedoms. Also, are there any free, as in freedom, email providers out there? There's a few. We'll discuss that. Also, every Linux distribution is awesome. That's what some people say. Every GNU slash Linux distribution out there is good. There's no bad distributions out there. Do I agree? Well, we'll discuss that as well. All on episode 8 of Unfettered Freedom. Now, I am your host, Derek Taylor, also known as DT or DistroTube over on Library and on YouTube. This podcast, as well as all of the video content on the DistroTube channel, is community-sponsored. I have no corporate sponsorships of any kind. Because of the community support that I receive, I can say what I want. There's no product shilling in these episodes. And if you like that, and if you like my work, please consider supporting my work. I'd greatly appreciate it. Please consider subscribing to DistroTube over on Patreon. And the first story to discuss is Eric S. Raymond's bold prediction that Windows 10 will eventually just be an emulation layer sitting on top of the Linux kernel is basically what he's predicting here. And for those of you that are not familiar with who Eric S. Raymond is and why you know he makes this pred- prediction and people are going to listen to it, it's because Eric S. Raymond is one of the most important figures within the open source community. He helped found the open source movement. He was one of the original people that coined that term open source. He helped found the open source initiative, the OSI. He wrote a very important book called The Cathedral and the Bazaar. And I suggest every single one of you listening to this podcast, check out The Cathedral and the Bazaar, especially if you're interested at all in software development and particularly open source software development. And I came across this story from over at ZDNet, an article written by Liam Tung, and it posits this question. Hey, will Windows lose the last phase of the desktop wars to Linux? Well, according to ESR, yes. Uh, Windows is in decline, basically, on the desktop, and Linux is on an uptick. And, of course, there is some evidence to this, but really, I think part of the problem with Windows, uh, people see it, as declining is just desktop computing in general is in decline so microsoft isn't as invested necessarily in windows as it was in years past microsoft makes most of its profits on non-windows things these days so i i Microsoft is a trillion dollar company. Most of that money they are making these days has nothing to do with the Windows operating system. So Eric S. Raymond is making a point that Windows isn't really a viable profit engine anymore for Microsoft. And he says that now that PC prices are are falling and once they fall below the level, well, he says $350, once it falls below that level, then the Microsoft tax doesn't make any sense for OEMs to to put up with anymore. Why pay that Microsoft tax to have Windows installed on your OEM devices when, of course, Linux is free? Mr. Raymond points to certain signs that he's seeing that lead him to conclude that Microsoft is eventually leading in this direction, such as the Windows subsystem for Linux. Microsoft is making big investments in that particular technology. He also has noted that Microsoft is starting to release more software for Linux, such as the upcoming Edge browser. The Edge browser will start shipping on Linux in October. Also running on Linux, just off the top of my head, Microsoft Teams runs on Linux. It's got a native client. VS Code, of course, runs on Linux. Skype runs on Linux, although to be fair, Skype has had a Linux client for many, many years, long before 
Microsoft was really interested in open source and Linux anyway, so forget about Skype, but Teams, VS Code, and Edge are all kind of recent things that we're just now getting on Linux, you know, in the last few months or the last year or two. And Mr. Raymond points out that, you know, Microsoft developers are actually contributing to the Linux kernel, and apparently the Microsoft employees are working well with the kernel team. Of course, Microsoft is a platinum member of the Linux Foundation. Of course, a lot of that work that goes into the Linux kernel as far as the commits from the Microsoft development team, those are, of course, to help improve the Windows subsystem for Linux. Eventually, Microsoft wants to be able to use the Windows subsystem for Linux to run Linux graphical applications, GUI applications. And it's also very important things like Proton and Wine as far as gaming. So many Windows games actually run in this emulation layer, if you will, on top of Linux, you know, running things like Wine, Wine containers and Proton. And it's becoming almost to the point where very soon it could be possible to run any Windows program on Linux where no longer does Microsoft even need its operating system. It can just make the software it needs to make, but it can just be run on Linux. And, and that could be the direction that Microsoft will eventually hit. I don't know. I don't know if Microsoft would be willing to give up that control because having your own operating system, having control of your own kernel, you know, obviously Microsoft is a different Microsoft as far as they are contributing to open source software a lot more these days, but there's probably stuff in the NT kernel, the Windows kernel, that Microsoft wants there. It's not freedom respecting, it's not privacy respecting stuff, and I'm not sure they would ever want to get away from that and just move to something based on the Linux kernel. I, I don't see that happening, at, at least not right now. Maybe 10 years down the road maybe they will eventually arrive to that decision but right now i don't know I, the microsoft guys have to convince me a lot more that they're actually interested in open source as far as the principles of open source not just the fact that open source can make them some money speaking of money eric s raymond does mention that it would save microsoft so much money if they would quit working on their own kernel and their own operating system, why spend billions developing your own thing when you can just freeload off of the community? Let the community that's already working on the Linux kernel do their thing. You contribute what you need to contribute to the Linux kernel and just use Linux. Now, whether Eric is right about his predictions or not, one of the things that bothers me about the possibility that this could happen is that if we ever get to that point where Microsoft is using the Linux kernel for all of its stuff, and you know Microsoft already has a large role in the Linux foundation, and Microsoft, if they go in this direction, will have their hands even more just all over Linux. And will they potentially corrupt what up until now, I think, has been a rather pure and noble thing, the Linux kernel and, of course, our GNU slash Linux distributions. How will that affect Linux going forward if Microsoft, which is the dominant operating system, you know, with, with Windows, and now all of those Windows programs, which are mostly proprietary programs, now they're all running on top of the kernel, the Linux kernel. Uh, how will that affect Again, our ecosystem, the Linux ecosystem, I don't know if it would be a positive or a negative, but it is something that concerns me. And the second story I want to discuss, it's not really a news story necessarily, but I was contacted by a viewer of my channel, and he asked me to take a look at the Respondus Lockdown Browser because he's been forced to use it at his school or university, and it's really disturbing because Respondus is yet another one of these programs that is designed to combat cheating. So, so many people now have to go to school remotely. And it's one of these pieces of software that tracks everything you do, all your key presses, and you know, it's listening through the microphone and watching you through the camera. And all of this is designed to combat cheating. But, okay, I, I agree. You don't want students to cheat. But at the end of the day, if the choice is between letting some of your students that want to cheat, cheat, or invading all of your students' privacy... Let the students that cheat, cheat. 
I mean, it, it seems like an easy decision. I can't believe, especially at the university level, which all of these university professors, most of them are going to have a master's degree, at least usually a doctorate. And they should be well-educated people. I don't understand how they can, in good faith, tell the students of their classes to install this proprietary garbage spyware on the, their machines, forcing them to install this spyware on their home computers and their home laptops. So obviously, I've never used this particular piece of software. I would never install it on any of my machines. Uh, and typically, these pieces of spyware don't have Linux versions. That's another thing with things like ProctorU and Respondus. It's typically, you have to install these on a Windows machine, maybe Windows or Mac. But Linux is never an option. So that's another thing. And, you know, I, if I have no machine that runs the operating systems that support Respondus, now I have to go install something like Microsoft Windows, something that maybe I object to morally or maybe financially I just can't afford a copy of Microsoft Windows. I damn sure can't go afford a, a new MacBook, you know, typically if I'm a broke college student, just to install the Respondus spyware. So just briefly looking at the Respondus homepage, how... Lockdown works the Respondus Lockdown browser. It works by displaying everything full screen. Nothing can be minimized, and that's because it's monitoring what's going on on the screen. Everything on the screen, I guess, probably has to be able to be viewed remotely in some way. Uh, it looks like it prevents access to certain kinds of applications, so instant messaging, you know, chat applications, virtual machines. Also, you can't use a VM. That's another reason why a Linux user can't use this, because even if I wanted to, I couldn't install Windows in a VM and then run Respondus in a VM. It will detect the VM and assume you're cheating. You can't use remote desktops. Uh, printing and screen capture are disabled. Copying and pasting, it looks like, is also d disabled. Right-click menu options, you know, typically on m most desktop environments, you know, including the desktop environments on Windows and Mac. You know, you have a right-click menu usually that gives you some options. A lot of those options are disabled. Any of the ones that you could use potentially for cheating, probably things like copy, paste, print, things like that. Now, thankfully, a lot of students are smarter than their professors at the college level. Let's just be real here, because uh, the students are saying, hey, we don't want this. We're not going to use this. Uh, many of them are starting petitions and, you know, creating a, a fuss. Uh, it, it didn't take me long doing a quick search to find instances of universities where students were rebelling against things. And, you know, in this one article I, I read from students complaining, you know, students were complaining that their computers were running slower after installing Respondus or Respondus, the installation maybe broke their computer. I don't know, you know, what is involved in that, but there's also concerns as far as privacy, of course, and students are like, hey, we're giving these pieces of spyware, such as Respondus and ProctorU, access to everything on our computer, every piece of data on our computer, all user data and everything. You know, there's personal stuff on my personal computer that nobody should have access to. Not Respondus, the makers of that software, and not the system administrators and not your school administrators as well. And, and they're absolutely right. This is a complete violation of your right to privacy, for one thing. I know not everybody, of course has a right to privacy, you know, depending on the laws of your nation, but certainly here in the U.S., and, and this is widespread, almost every university in the U.S. is using things like this, these anti-cheating spyware things like Respondus and ProctorU and, and, and other programs like that. You know, in response to this, I would say, you know, I don't want to be controversial with this statement, but I am 100% serious I would tell students right now, especially because of the COVID pandemic, if you can't go and have an in-person lecture you know, at your university, if you can't actually be in a classroom and get one-on-one -on -one training from a professor, just don't go to university this semester or take a year off you know, or maybe don't go back at all because college degrees quite frankly aren't what they used to be you're not likely to get the job you want and you, typically you're going to come out of it tens of thousands of dollars in debt anyway and at the same time now you're having to give up so much freedom you know they, they, morally i would be against a lot of this stuff it's just not worth it anymore 
to attend university, maybe in a few years, once the world kind of corrects itself. <laughs> a lot of times, you know, these kinds of things, we push things so far in one direction, but they'll eventually correct themselves at some point. But right now, I w if I were a student, if I were a college student right now, unless I was very close to graduating, if I was a first or second year student, yeah, I'd probably just take some time off, take a semester or two off and, you know, see where things are maybe in 2022. And our third story is about DRM. DRM stands for Digital Rights Management, but that is really a horrible name. It's not about defending anybody's rights. It's actually designed to limit you, the user, your rights. And one of the things that I came across the other day was a post over on Reddit. And that Reddit post is titled, A False Way to View DRM Protected Netflix Streams? Question mark. They're asking, hey, is there a free and open source way to view DRM protected streams on Netflix? So he, I'm assuming he has a Netflix account, but he doesn't like DRM. He doesn't want to necessarily watch that content by having to log in with his user credentials and all of that on a Netflix account. Hey, can he just stream it in something like MPV? And the short answer to that is no, you can't. You can't really get around DRM. Uh, there's no way to circumvent the, the DRM protections on things like Netflix and Hulu and all of that. Unfortunately, you really only have two options with DRM streams. What I would suggest doing is don't sign up for a Netflix account and maybe look for alternative ways of getting that content. Now, I don't want to suggest anything that could be illegal in your locality, but obviously there's websites out there where you can go and find those TV shows and movies and music that you like, and you can circumvent having to use services like Netflix and Hulu and things like that. Now, I don't want to promote piracy because piracy again is illegal in a lot of places in the world but you know from a moral perspective if you think that DRM is immoral and you also think that piracy is immoral then you kind of have to figure out hey what's the lesser of two evils and make your own choices on that now this reddit post did get me to thinking about the free software foundation and their stance against DRM and the free software foundation uh, one of their biggest fights, of course, is the fight against DRM. They even have a, a separate website designed to spread awareness about DRM. DefectiveByDesign.org is a piece of property, web property, that is owned by the Free Software Foundation. It's part of the Free Software Foundation. And this web page is designed to let people know what is DRM, why is it evil, how you can take action, you know, donate to the Free Software Foundation, become a member... And they also talk about some of the large companies that take advantage of their users. On their homepage, they have a list of what they call repeat offenders. Quote, these companies don't want a free web. They think they make money by limiting your freedom. So these are the gigantic companies that make all of their money or most of their money by limiting people's freedoms with things like DRM. And that list of companies includes Amazon, Netflix, Apple, Google, Microsoft, Sony. They even have the W3C in here. Oh, that's interesting as well. But the W3C, of course, went along with all of this digital rights crap too. So you might as well throw them in the list as well. And, you know, one of the dirty truths about DRM is the fact that the executives of these companies, these companies don't want the public to know anything about DRM. They don't want you to know how you are being used by these companies. The, uh, this website, DefectiveByDesign.org, they have this quote from Peter Lee, who was a Disney executive. Uh, he was quoted back in 2005 as saying the following quote, If consumers even know there's a DRM, what it is, or how it works, we've already failed, unquote. So he's basically saying the public doesn't need to know about DRM. They don't even know, need to know it's there. It's there. But if they ever become aware that it's there, then they might want to know what it does. And once they know what it does, they are going to resist it. And he's absolutely right. <laughs> That's an executive of a company that uses DRM. Now, our fourth story is of a similar vein. Uh, it was another one of these Reddit posts that I came across, and they were asking another free and open source software kind of question. And that question was about email providers. 
This Reddit post is titled, Are there any free email service providers? Are there any recommendations you would all give me for free email service providers that are both free of charge and respect my privacy? So this person wants something that is free, as in beer, free of charge. They also want something free, as in freedom, something that respects their privacy. And the Free Software Foundation does have a page over at fsf.org. They have a page titled Free Software Webmail Systems, and they list out a bunch of webmail services. And they have a, uh, well, they have three lists here. They have a recommended list. They have a under review list. So these are services that might be okay, but they're still under some scrutiny by the FSF. They're not really sure about them just yet. And then, they, of course, they have the not recommended list. Very briefly, I will cover some of the highlights from these lists. The not recommended list is all of your usual subjects. Gmail. Everybody knows they probably shouldn't be using Gmail. Google is spying on you <laughs> by using that service. So uh, it is what it is. Uh, Yahoo Mail, although Yahoo Mail is not very popular these days. It's kind of waned in popularity. Yandex Mail, Microsoft Outlook, of course, Apple's iCloud, Mail.ru, and FastMail. Though FastMail is another one I haven't heard about in a long time. I don't know how many users FastMail have, but that's the not recommended list. If you are using those services, the companies behind those services are using you. Now let's talk about the under review list. So these are services that uh, the FSF doesn't just come out and recommend, but they're not saying, hey, stay away from these either. These are just under review services. And there are two big names on this list. And these are probably the two webmail services that most people recommend when people ask about free as in freedom webmail services. Proton Mail and Tutanota. Now, the reason that they're still under review, I guess, from the FSF is because of JavaScript. A lot of the mail services listed under the under review section, they're under that section because those sites still require JavaScript. They either require JavaScript for you to register and use the system, or they require JavaScript period. Like you, the site won't even load without JavaScript. And it looks like that's the case with ProtonMail. They have a note here, ProtonMail, the JavaScript is needed to register and use the system. So that's a no-go from a freedom standpoint. But yeah, uh, I mean, JavaScript on the web, it's kind of hard to to get away from. To denote us, same thing. They have a note under it. Looks promising. And they're working on becoming LibreJS compliant. But of course, right now they're still using non-free JavaScript. Now, as far as a 100% free as in freedom webmail service, there is a recommended list here. I have never heard of any of these services, but I will just quickly read them. They are Posteo, RiseUp, Colab Now, Melnesia, SafeMail.net, VF Email, 10-Minute Email, Gorilla Mail, and Spam Gourmet. So I've, I don't know anything about those services, but if you want more information, look for this page over at the FSF.org. It's titled Free Software Webmail Systems. And our final topic is the topic of, is every GNU slash Linux distribution good? Are all of them good? You know, that, because that's kind of a sentiment you do hear from people in the community. You hear the fact that there are no bad distros out there. Yeah, you may not like one. It may not be right for you. But all of them are awesome in their own way. So this comes from another Reddit post here. And this was over at the r slash Linux subreddit. And this is titled, Every Distro is Awesome. And this thing got like 2,000 upvotes. So a lot of people really love this post. And I'll briefly read it. This guy writes, Every distro is awesome. Quote, Ubuntu is awesome because it provides an easy and well-known entry point to people to use Linux and helps bring Linux into business. CentOS and RHEL are big driving forces behind the Linux use in servers and supports the secure and stable internet we have today. Manjaro and Pop! OS provide good platforms for the first-time Linux user at home and helped Linux gaming adoption and support. Arch provides incredible community resources like the Arch Wiki and allows people to start tinkering with Linux in deeper ways without having a huge barrier to entry. Gentoo provides an incredible platform on which users can build what they want from the ground up and provides fantastic in-depth community resources in the process. And all the other distros that I can't sit here and spend two hours naming are all awesome and collective communities that do amazing work. Use the distro you want and have fun. All right. 
<laughs> so <laughs> that's a nice post. That's, I can see why that got 2,000 upvotes. It's a very utopian look at the Linux ecoscape, right? The ecosystem out there as far as all the distributions we have. They're all amazing. They all do their own thing. Now, do I agree with that? I agree with what he put in this post. I, uh, he or she, I'm not exactly sure, but Ubuntu is awesome because it does this. It's easy. It helps bring new people to Linux. Yeah, uh, great. Yeah, absolutely agree. CentOS and Real are big in servers and business. And you know, Okay, great. Manjaro and Pop OS, they're great because of gaming adoption and you know, all the stuff they do for Steam integration and things. Oh, I agree. Arch. Arch has the wiki. <laughs> yeah, you're right. That's, I guess that's Arch's uh, contribution. I might have went into a little more detail with Arch other than hey arch has the wiki oh and then gen 2 you, you build it from the ground up yeah i agree and they're all awesome because of that but the one thing i will say about his list is these are all big distributions and like main distributions like if you were building a tree of linux distributions these are some of the major major branches off of that tree so you know things like ubuntu and red hat and arch and gentoo especially they're major branches of the linux tree now centos is based on real manjaro's based on arch but even those i mean manjaro does a lot of things differently from Arch. It's, you know, it, it, based on Arch, it uses the same repositories, but it does a lot of things differently than Arch. So they're doing their own thing. And I think that's what he's getting at with the distributions he just named here. Not every Linux distribution is like that, though. There are a lot of distributions out there that are not unique in any way. They are simply, I forked a distribution I changed the GTK theme and the icon theme, you know, put a nice wallpaper on it, but they're not necessarily doing anything unique. And that's always been my complaint. I agree. Most Linux distributions are awesome as far as I can get all of them installed and I can pretty much run any Linux distribution I want to run. If I'm being honest, they're all pretty good. It's rare I come across one that doesn't install correctly or after you get it installed correctly, it just doesn't work right. That's rare. It's, it's rare you find one of those that's just broken. I can think about, you know, the early days of my YouTube channel. I remember, you know, doing so many distro reviews, especially in that first year. You know, I probably reviewed like 200 different Linux distributions over the history of my YouTube channel. And it's very, very rare that I found a bad one. If you go back and look at my distro reviews, I can only think of a handful that, like, I said, hey, this is bad. Like, it's, this doesn't work. It's it's trash. I typically, I'm not one of those people that get angry and trash somebody's work. But of the 200 or so that I've ever taken a look at, there's really just a handful that I thought, yeah, this isn't good. But there's another argument to be had, too. So say I reviewed 200 distributions in the history of the YouTube channel. Five were bad. But what I also sometimes don't point out to you is a lot of those other 195 distros that weren't bad. You know, they installed fine and I could use them. But a lot of those 195 distributions are not unique in any way. They don't really serve a purpose. And there's a lot of duplication of effort out there. From a free as in freedom perspective, I can also say that not all GNU slash Linux distributions are the same as far as their take on proprietary software. Some of them, well, most GNU slash Linux distributions, of course, have some proprietary software in them. I mean, you can't get around some of that because of the drivers and multimedia codecs and things like that. But some of them install unnecessary proprietary software. They go out of their way to install proprietary garbage on their systems. No proprietary web browsers, proprietary text editors, proprietary office suites. I don't like that. I, I have never thought that was a good idea. By default, all of your user applications should be free and open source software if you're maintaining a GNU slash Linux distribution. I know not everybody supports the free software movement or the open source software movement, but think about it. If you're maintaining a GNU slash Linux distribution and you don't support the free software movement, it's it's a contradiction. It's an oxymoron, and I don't understand why some people that maintain Linux distributions can't see that. 
But overall, without me ranting too much, I, I agree with most of the sentiment. With it, this was just designed to be a wholesome Reddit post. This guy's every distro is awesome post. It was nice. It was friendly, you know. And you know what? I'll I'll upvote it too. We'll give him a upvote right here on camera, because for the most part, yeah, he's right. They're all pretty much awesome. And that is it for this edition of Unfettered Freedom. Unfettered Freedom is now a bi-weekly podcast, so we release every two weeks. Now before I go, I need to thank the producers of this episode. I need to thank Michael, Gabe, Corbinian, Mitchell, Devin, Fran, Arch5530, Akami Channel, Chuck, Claudio, Donnie, Dylan, George, Caleb, Devils, Lewis, Paul, Scott, and Willie. These guys, they are my highest tiered patrons over on Patreon. Without these guys, episode 8 of Unfettered Freedom would not have been possible. I also want to thank each and every one of these ladies and gentlemen, all these names you're seeing on the screen. Those of you watching the video podcast are seeing a lengthy list of names on the screen. These are all my supporters over on Patreon because, again, this channel is supported by you guys, the community. If you'd like to support my work, please look for DistroTube over on Patreon. All right, guys. Peace. <laughs>